man like a tree is nourished by his roots. His roots grow in different parts of the world. The branches of his family tree spread out over thousands of years and kilometers. But he considers himself a son of the Kazakh land, the land where the nomads of the Great Steppe reached the highest goals. Arman Umarkojev, traveler, historian, archaeologist in the new season of the Kandala project. One of my most vivid impressions of a museum exhibit is from the Hermitage. I'm talking about the Pearl of the Pazari collection, a pile carpet. When I saw it for the first time, my initial thought was, no way, what a beauty! How is it possible that this carpet is two and a half thousand years old? The topic of our episode today is Art Woven Through the Millennia and we will have a conversation about the origins, history and evolution of weaving on our land with an art historian, Natalia Bajanova. If people were able to weave these enormous carpets with such intricate ornaments, they must have learned it from someone. The first ever image that archaeologists discovered on tombs, on the wall of tombs, in ancient Egypt was the image of a loom. Even back in the Stone Age people were weaving mats. The first signs of weaving were already there. Natalia Bajenova, artist, art critic, senior researcher at the Kasteyev State Museum of Art, Kazakh applied arts expert. What kind of thread did ancient weavers use in their work? They used vegetable yarn, which was made from various plants. For example, flax. Then, of course, wool threads. And a little later, when silk appeared in ancient China, people started using it in carpet weaving as well. Interesting point is that silk carpets are of different quality. There is a very high number of knots per one square decimeter in silk carpets. In fact, the quality of a rug is determined by the number of knots. The Bronze Age expositions in Kazakh museums have reconstructions of clothes of Andronovo culture. Does this mean that already back then people could weave fabric for clothes? They wove fabric for dresses, for outer clothing and for headdresses. It was a simple weave that was used to create clothes afterwards. So it means that nomads had already been engaged in sheep farming. And the first material they used was sheep wool. It's not without reason that they say golden fleece, because it is absolutely impossible to imagine the life of nomadic civilization without wool, without sheep. And the sheep is a totem animal for a reason. The clothing of the Andronovo tribes was predominantly red. What dyes did they use and why those in particular? The reason is that throughout the entire territory of Kazakhstan and beyond grows a plant called Marena. What makes this plant unique is that every part of its roots and stems is used to create different colors. Artisans can obtain so many color shades and gradations, it's really amazing. Maybe this also explains the fact that the yurt is predominantly red in color. 
not just a bright red color, but a deep shade of it. As the Kazakhs say, Khongr. It's a rich, deep and beautiful color. From pink shades to deep brown, burgundy and ruby. The palette is simply spectacular. Tell me, have the traces of Andronovo culture been somehow preserved in later times? And in what ways have they manifested in Kazakh culture? First and foremost, it's manifested via geometric style. In general, geometric style is characteristic of weaving since these forms are the easiest to make. So it's like when a child draws some simple lines at first and then, as he grows older, these lines become more complex and transform into something intricate, right? Indeed, at first there were zigzag lines, squares, rhombi and triangles. Well, as a matter of fact, they are present in modern carpets as well. We began our conversation with the Pazirik carpet. It is really huge in size. This carpet is interesting from the point of view of artistic style and is absolutely priceless from the archaeological point of view. We can see different styles intertwined here. It's a unique carpet indeed, in the sense that there is an ornament, but there is also a story composition. There are riders and horses lined up in a row. There are deer and birds, there's floral ornamentation. There are mythical winged creatures. I mean, it's some kind of a synthesis. It seems to me that this carpet is not just a rug that can be laid on the floor. It's a ritualistic carpet, and there is a reason why it appeared to be in the mound. It must have played a sacred role, maybe the role of a threshold to the beyond, like seeing a person off to the other world. Thanks to this carpet, we have the opportunity to see with our own eyes what the people of that time looked like. And in my opinion, this is the first image in the history of the nomads. Breathtaking. It's really something. I think it is indeed a gift from heaven that archaeologists found such an object. It's a unique artifact, and the carpet composition that is depicted there can be seen in modern carpets. That is, there is a central field and a multi-layer border. These carpets are so enduring that they have been passed down from generation to generation. The Huns came to replace the Sarkos. The Huns showed themselves to be more active, more mobile, and their nomadic way of life influenced the development of weaving as well. Because it was very convenient to roll up a rug, throw it on your back, literally strap it to the saddle and move on. At any convenient place you could just stop, unfold it, spread it out and feel like home again. I would also like to say, I just recall this property of wool. It turns out that when a man went away and knew that he would spend the night in the steppe, he took with him a rope made of wool, like a lasso. It helped to scare off snakes and insects. That were just panic stricken with sheep which could trample and crush them and their nests. Can you imagine such an incredible invention? Just simple rope that protected the human. It's time for us to turn the pages of ancient history and travel to an era in which Kazakh ethnos had already formed and accordingly brought some of its own motives to the weaving practices that had existed previously. Weaving is an amazing chapter in the book of Kazakh applied arts. First, it involves a very painstaking and long process of preparation. To make yarn, people needed to shear sheep. They sheared sheep in autumn because the wool obtained during that time was the one people used to make yarn. After that, it had to be whipped with twigs. To do that, women used to sit together and whip this wool. Then, the artisans made the yarn, dyed it and prepared it for weaving. Weaving is a 
If we take a virtual tour around a Kazakh yurt, a traditional Kazakh yurt, what types of weaving and items will we see in the first place? The pattern ribbons of Baskur and Bao, they were placed under the dome. They looked very beautiful when hung up, creating this kind of a pattern. And they resembled the Milky Way, you could say, dotted with these ornaments. The ornaments are very different. In some of the Akhbaskurs, they are not even repeated. Can you imagine? There are 20 meters of pattern and absolutely no repetition. The symbolism of the tree of the world, threefold nature of the universe, such deep symbolism is contained in these ornaments. Can we state that the Baskur has its own language? And by looking at it, can we get any additional information about people, about what was going on in this or that family? Now, this is a very interesting question, because Baskurs, especially Ak Baskurs of Western Kazakhstan, Eastern Kazakhstan and Southern region are just like an encrypted map. For example, there is the Ak Baskur Alasha in a museum collection, which depicts the jewelry of the Kazakh people. When the artisans transferred this ornament on the pattern ribbon, they implied the function of a talisman. Here we can notice both geometric and cosmogonic ornamentations, but also some zoomorphic and vegetative. So it's a kind of synthesis of these ornaments. Each region and even each tribe has its own specific ornamentation. And what kind of looms did they use? They used horizontal weaving loom called urmek. Kazakh artisans used it up until the 1980s. It was very convenient. It was a demountable transportable construction. That is, a master could collect it at any time, wrap it up and then unfold and continue weaving in some other place. For example, the same Baskur Bao, which were woven to fasten the frame of the yurt along the entire perimeter, reached up to 30 meters. Can you imagine? Naturally, weaving them required a lot of time. The masters could not make them in one day. Thanks to this demountable and easily transportable construction of the loom, the masters were able to continue their work at any time. They used to weave mainly near the yurt, in the daytime, under the canopy. There are three generations represented in this part of the exhibition, namely the daughter, the mother and the grandmother. This art was passed down from generation to generation, from person to person. It took a long time to master because it took long hours of hard work to create a baskur. How is Alasha made and where was it meant to be placed? The Alashas were intended both for the floor of the yurt and for the kerige. Those Alashas that were woven for the yurt kerige, that is, for the wall, were decorated with a rich and beautiful frieze. The Alashas were made on a narrow weave loom or mek. Firstly, they made long equal strips. Then they were cut into equal parts and finally sewn together. Let's continue our discussion about the anthology and varieties of Kazakh traditional carpets. Pile carpets are woven with one and a half knot and a double knot. This is a very ancient technology which has been preserved in Pazara culture since even more ancient times. There are many more pile-free techniques and the names of different carpets are created based on these techniques. For example, the technique of Bizkiste reminds embroidery. There are carpets which are woven using a mixed technique, for example, the ones that use both pile and pile-free weaving. Is there any canon for creating such carpets in terms of ornaments or color palettes? 
There are about four, five, six elements on a pile carpet called rapport, seven elements at most, and they repeat throughout the surface of the carpet. As for color, there was not much diversity either, mostly about five basic colors that repeat. Probably the range of these woven items was very wide. Apart from large carpets which were designed to be placed on the floor and for the kirige of the yurt, of course, there were small carpets. They were called klemshe. I would like to pay particular attention to the khurjan, a traditional white bag made from felt and decorated with national ornaments. Why? Because it is not just a travel bag that is loaded on laden animals. It is a ceremonial thing, which has an important role in the wedding ceremony. Usually, people would put different treats, goodies, cuts of clothes in it, that is, various gifts, which were then presented to the in-laws. And this tradition still exists. Nowadays, khorjans are sued from beautiful fabrics decorated with ornaments. However, previously these products were woven, and the most interesting thing is that the khorjan is closed with a looping method, the prototype of a modern zipper. Вот ткались и самое интересное, коржин закрывается петельным методом. Это прототип современной молнии. As for the subject of коржин, the Kazakhs have many kinds of коржинs, the names of which are associated with their purpose. For example, the korjin for storage of common utensils is called ayak kap. The korjin under the name of kese kap is intended for piala, drinking bowls, storage. The korjin spread to its full length was thrown over the back of the saddle. By the way, this travel bag was used not only during migrations. After arriving at the destination and installing the yurt, the Kazakh people used to hang this korjin inside the yurt, where it then served as a decoration. They are decorated with different ornaments. The variations of many of the patterns depend on the regions. For example, geometric designs are typical of the north, and floral ones are common in the southern parts of Kazakhstan. Many Kazakh rituals are associated with korjin, such as sewing the korjin and unpicking the korjin. When a young couple gets married, the groom's parents prepare a korjin filled with gifts for the new kinfolk. After that, in the bride's village, her family opens the korjin and distributes the gifts. And this rite was conventionally called unpicking the korjin. In fact, it was not stitched and there was no need to unpick it. They simply untied the rope with which the korjin was tied, because according to the Kazakh beliefs, it was not supposed to be cut. Can you name the regions which became central to the Kazakh weaving? The type of weaving that was widespread throughout the entire territory of Kazakhstan was pile-free weaving. As for pile weaving, it was concentrated in the south of Kazakhstan. This is the place where pile carpets, the real ones from sheep's wool, were woven. Probably it can be explained by the fact that it takes much longer to weave a pile carpet rather than a pile-free one. The summers in the south are way longer and there is more sun. Hence, it's possible to dedicate more time to this process. Our neighbor Turkmenistan is also famous for weaving traditions. Were there any ceremonies or rituals when weavers were doing their work? Before they started weaving, masters used to invite guests, their friends and relatives, and organized a celebration in order to make a carpet of good quality and one that would serve well for a long time. When they finished making the carpet, they also gathered guests and arranged a feast. In fact, the traditions of applied arts of any nation are very sustainable. They are based on some inner sacred foundations. Being passed down from generation to generation, from mother to daughter, little has changed. Although Kazakh artisans of the 20th century could adopt something new easily, they even wanted to deviate from tradition a little. 
This is why, in the 1970s and 80s, we have examples of carpets that depict animals. While in fact Kazakh ornaments do not really have specific images of animals, they are all stylized as ornaments. You know, I've seen some depictions of folk artists on them. I wouldn't be surprised, because we have portraits too. It was done well with volume and shadows. This is quite a tapestry. To make a tapestry, first you must prepare a sketch. The artist depicts the idea of a tapestry in this sketch, and based on that he chooses the threads. These colored threads are used in coloring. So we take not just red and yellow threads, but we mix them with other colors. Here the main color is red. By mixing warm and cold tones we get smooth color transitions, which match well with each other. In order to make the tapestry straight and smooth while weaving it, we put a cardboard right underneath. After that it is necessary to make strapping. This is how the strapping is done. Then, on top of that, we make another strapping. As a result, the fastened thread will not move back and forth. It will be tight and stationary. This technique has been around since ancient times, and we still use it today. Based on the exhibitions, festivals and cooperation with artisans in Kazakhstan, what can you say about the state of weaving in our country today? Of course, the weaving, in the form in which it existed a few decades ago, does not exist today. Masters weave carpets, but not on such a large scale. I would like to tell you about Dana Yerik. She lives in Shymkent. Her personal collection of carpets consists of a thousand Kazakh carpets. Can you imagine? And she is in favor of opening a museum of carpets in Kazakhstan. This would really be wonderful. For example, there are some wonderful carpet museums in Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan. The Kazakh carpet too has everything to become famous and deserves for the carpet museum to be opened. When I came to work in the museum and saw all these things, I had a culture shock. I was really struck by such an abundance of exhibits. First of all, the weaving techniques, ornaments, colors, coloring, compositional elements. A magical world appeared before my eyes. These household items were hung on the walls, spread out on the floor. In fact, they witnessed a child's birth, a family's creation, communion with the gods and passing on to the afterlife. By continuing these ancient traditions, we maintain the thread of time. Did 